Picking back up, um, Manuela Sainz, uh, pictured here, was um, Bolivar's lover and co-conspirator in helping him organize the independence movements, organize his armies. She played a significant role in the independence movement, um, but her story was one that had been told by various authors over the generations as having been nothing more than a harlot. Uh, because they were never married. Um, they were lovers, but being a woman and in the early independence era, um, her role in all of the events was really downplayed until just recently. In 2010, um, her remains were symbolically uh, moved over to the gravesite of Bolivar, so she was laying by his side. And I say they were symbolically moved because she was actually buried in a mass pauper's grave when she died. Um, and so they're not her, her remains specifically. Um, uh, but again, the idea that kind of rescuing her story, um, to show her heroism and, and what she accomplished, um, and getting all of the, the baggage, the religious and cultural baggage about, uh, her and Bolivar having not been married out of the way is hugely significant. Um, and as we know, Juana Asorduri, um, was a woman who, dressed as a man, um, even though it was known she was a woman. Um, she fought along her husband, uh, or alongside her husband, I should say. Um, it was known that she was a, a woman, but uh, she had to really emphasize masculine traits in order to gain any sort of recognition uh, during her own time. And so again, as we know, and we can see kind of, again, unfortunately, between the lines through independence era writings, um, that women were a big part of that push uh, to gain the independence of Latin America. Um, and fortunately, there have been efforts to rescue their stories in recent years. Um, also from the independence era, in terms of uh, novels and short stories, uh, there was this trend uh, towards something called costumbrismo. And I liked the... Um, description in Spanish that's given here in this slide, so I included it, um, and I'll give a, a sort of rough translation of it. Um, but it says, uh, costumbrismo in literature um, reflects uh, usos y costumbres, which are uses and customs, um, social uses and customs, without analyzing them or interpreting them. Um, and this is also a form um, that is entrenched in literary realism. Um, and that is something that it is direct, directly related to. So in other words, Costumbrismo um, looks at the lives and traditions of everyday folk in Latin America, especially indigenous folk, uh, mestizo peoples of various um, stripes, and rural people, people who lived differently than those in the cities. Um, although um, there was some attention, especially by the late 19th century, of costumbrismo writers to um, focus on these kinds of people in urban settings and how they lived in the cities, you know, how they came to somewhere like Montevideo, for example, and continued to wear their traditional dress and to practice some of their traditional customs. So costumbrismo writing in the 19th century, um, coming out of the independence era, was something that Latin American writers had in common. And I mentioned below uh, Andres Bello, um, Cuban Jose Maria uh, Heredia, uh, and then Esteban, uh, I should say Echeverria. Um, I, mess, I misspelled that one, sorry. Um, <laughs> they were romantic writers in that they uh, kind of stepped away from the empiricism of the Enlightenment and really wanted to emphasize the human condition, the emotions, love, uh, the things that human beings experience. But they did so in a way that was costumbrista, meaning that they um, kind of caricatured um, regular folk in Latin America. Um, so the guy that is here is Andres Bello. Um, he was one of a group of authors that included um, all three of those that I've listed here that came together in Paris. And uh, this was another kind of aspect of creating a uniquely Latin American literature. Um, they published journals together, uh, literary journals um, in which they were able to um, uh, get stories out to 
um, not, I was going to say the people, but it would still have to be educated people, people with the means to uh, buy their, uh, their journal, which again would be kind of like a thick magazine. Um, and I should have mentioned, um, let me go back, uh, Bello, uh spent most of his time in London. He had just kind of a tangential connection to the group in Paris. It was uh, Heredia and Echeverria, among others, this is Heredia, um, who got together in Paris. But the point of all of them is that they were Latin Americas in Europe who were trying to kind of shape Latin American literature as a form. Um, and so I wanted to, the reason I'm looking at my notes is because I wanted to mention a few of the journals that this group and uh, others that followed them published. Um, Bello published one called El Reportorio Americano from London. Um, the others, the group from Paris, published uh, one called Sur. Um, they ended up publishing that one out of Buenos Aires. Um, Echeverria was involved with that one. Um, he's here. Um, Origenes was a journal published in Havana. Uh, Contemporaneos in Mexico City. Um, and then uh, currently there are journals such as Letras Libres that come out of Mexico um, and others from around the region. Um, talking about um, uh, Echeverria, his most important works um, included a poem called La Cautiva and a novel called El Matadero. Um, and again, those are important because they were costumbrista works. Um, let's see. Along with publishing his journal, um, Echeverria had a group that got together. They met in Buenos Aires um, to kind of compare notes, to comment on each other's uh, literary work, on their poetry, and so on. Um, he wasn't necessarily a major poet, but he was influential in terms of the amount of work that he published and his um, kind of energy around having a literary journal. All of these guys and women, most importantly, um, were also involved in this kind of forming of a um, regular, regularly published Latin American literature. Um, so these were mostly poets, although some of them, like Jose Hernandez, um, he is pictured here. He wrote the epic poem Martin Fierro, um, which was about gaucho life. Um, uh, Martin Fierro is synonymous with the gaucho in Argentina because of the epic that he wrote. And it was a commentary on the lives of, you know, essentially what were uh, maybe almost analogous to cowboys um, in 19th century in the Pampas in Argentina and beyond. Um, so his work centered around um, kind of costumbrista portraits of, of gauchos, whereas um, figures like, um, let's see, we have the Colombian uh, Jose Maria Torres Caicedo here. Uh, we have the Chilean uh, Diego Barros Arana. And then the Argentine uh, here, uh, Jose Maria Gutierrez. Um, and again, all of them participated with people like Hernandez in um, reading each other's work, publishing together. And um, this, this group did get together in Paris. And they published a journal there called El Correo del Ultramar, uh, which is the um, uh, journal from overseas, essentially. Um, so again, I wanted to mention them because they're part of this big movement, but I wanted to really emphasize um, women's and people, you know, indigenous people um, and people of African heritage, their contributions to Latin American literature as well as we go along here. Uh, so this is uh, Gertrudis Gomez de Avellaneda. She was a Cuban writer who wrote um, most famously a novel called Sab. Saab was a um, enslaved man in Cuba. So of course in Cuba, slavery was something that persisted nearly as long as it did in Brazil. Um, slavery was only ended there in 1886 and it was ended in Brazil in 1888. And so what her story did, although um, a lot of critics have said, it's not the best literature that she wrote in terms of her um, phrasing and the kinds of images and things that she used but it was the most provocative in terms of making a political and a social statement. 
Um, so she spent much of her life living in Spain. She left Cuba when she was 22. Um, she came back to uh, Spain in, uh, or excuse me, she went to Cuba in, in 1859 to visit. By that time, she had published Saab. That was published in 1841. As you can see here, it was Madrid, 1841. Um, she had published a series of poems and a couple of other novels that got more critical acclaim. But again, this one, it was a story about uh, a man who was a slave who fell in love with the mistress of the plantation. Um, and it was something that, of course, was forbidden, couldn't be had, but it gave a vehicle through which she was able to comment on the injustices of the slave system and call attention to it. Um, let me flip this here. Um, oops, let's talk about that fine looking gentleman. Uh, <laughs> I thought there was uh, something else that was gonna pop up first, but he came up first. Um, this is Domingo Fausto Sarmiento. The reason I wanted to also bring him up, um, he was a major critic politically and intellectually of, of the dictator uh, Juan Manuel de Rosas in Argentina. So uh, Sarmiento is Argentine. Um, he was a major kind of intellectual heavyweight of his day. He became president of Argentina later in life. Um, he wrote a book that is known uh, by its subtitle Facundo. It was about a guy named Facundo Quiroga who was essentially like a kind of small scale um, local uh, caudillo. So someone who was loyal to Rosas um, and had an, his own loyal following in a rural area of Argentina. His book was about the kind of, um, uh, what do we want to call it? Dialectic of civilization versus barbarism. And it was called Civilization, Barbarism, The Life of uh, Facundo Quiroga. Um, and so what he wanted to do was really critique Rosas and the kinds of people that supported him and the kinds of light living that, you know, their, their ways of doing things or violence um, in favor of a more cultured and refined uh, read European and white way of doing things. Um, in the end, though, he painted a kind of romanticized portrait of people like Facundo. Um, you could kind of understand, you know, why culturally... Um, those around him would be so willing to support him. He died a tragic kind of heroic death in the novel. Um, and so again, the reason to bring him up is because he sets up this dichotomy of civilization and barbarism that along with costumbrismo was a major component of 19th century uh, Latin American literature. Um, but he also kind of tapped into that romantic way of looking at figures like Facundo. This woman, Clorinda Mato de Turner, um, she married a, a, an Anglo man, last name Turner, um, but she was known and important unto herself. Uh, she was Peruvian and she wrote a book called Ave Sin Nido, uh, or Birds Without a Nest. And this is one of the first major pieces of Latin American literature that could be called indigenista uh, or uh, indigenous. It was focused on the plight of the indigenous people in Peru, and it told the story of a man and a woman who were both uh, indigenous folks um, who lived in the same town. They had to work on the same uh, hacienda. Um, they fell in love only to find later that they shared the same father, the parish priest. Um, so it was not just a commentary on how indigenous people were treated, and also trying to present their way of life, again, in that costumbrista um, kind of way of being super uh, attentive to detail, the way that they dressed, the way that they spoke, the way that they did things, but also confronting the harsh realities of their lack of, of human rights um, and also the um, abuses that were frequently committed, all too frequently committed um, by priests who held power in their local uh, communities. Moving along to another phase, um, and I mentioned that I threw in the U.S.-Mexico War along with the Spanish-American War. Um, I want to talk about Ruben Darío. Um, he was a poet from Nicaragua, um, and uh, you can read that little bit of information there about him. It calls him the Prince of Castilian Letters, um, Castilian being um, the kind of 
what do we want to say, highbrow uh, way of speaking Spanish that comes from Europe, that comes from central Spain itself. Um, Dario was born in Nicaragua, uh, but he spent a lot of his life traveling around. Um, and so his poetry was really influenced by um, the people that he met, um, the people that he saw in other areas of South America, um, leaving as he did um, from uh, Nicaragua to Chile and other points. Um, and as I wrote there, he sometimes supported autocratic rulers. Um, he was able to hobnob with them. He was what we might call one of the first Latin American literary celebrities. So he had international renown. Um, people knew him um, the world over uh, for his work. And he um, not only drew from the romanticism uh, of the past and a little neoclassicism, um, but he started to kind of create his own um, uniquely uh, Latin American uh, way of writing that has been called Modernismo. Um, so in this period of imperialism, uh, Modernismo was something that uh, kind of drew distinctions between the Anglo-American world and the Latin American world in order to emphasize uh, Latin American ways of doing things as not backwards, but as having their own unique value. Um, so his work, again, was super important for that. Um, his most important book of poems was called Azul, uh, published in 1888. Um, you can read some of the others there uh, that he published. Um, and I mentioned him because he cast a long shadow, as I wrote over, I'll write, it's on the next slide, a long shadow over uh, Latin American literature uh, from his lifetime forward. Um, he critiqued... Um, he critiqued U.S. imperialism in the Spanish-American War. You can click there to read more about his poem to Roosevelt. That was to uh, Theodore Roosevelt, um, the one that Latin Americans tend to think the least of, uh, of the two Roosevelts. FDR was the one that initiated the good neighbor policy later on. Um, Roosevelt was the one who said that Latin America is our backyard. Um, so you can understand, again, um, why people in Latin America think of him not kindly. Um, and Dario's poem was critical of the U.S. turn toward trying to meddle in Latin American affairs, um, occupying militarily various nations, including Nicaragua, um, several times by, um, by the first couple of decades of the 20th century. And I forgot, I should have mentioned Caballero first. Uh, this was a historical novel by Jovita Gonzalez and Eve uh, Rayleigh that... Uh, was written in the 1930s, but it reflects on the U.S.-Mexico War. And there were other uh, writers of the period, including a man named Nicolás Pino Suárez. I couldn't find a, an image of him or his book, uh, but he wrote something called El Monedero. And uh, there were American writers as well, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, writing from different angles about the war, about the U.S. war against Mexico. Most writers wrote from a sort of nationalistic perspective, wanting to support their nation's uh, side and uh, actions in the conflict. Emerson, on the other hand, uh, wrote his famous essay on civil disobedience um, when he was thrown in prison for failing to pay his taxes during the war um, as a means of protesting it. He said, I don't agree, or I don't believe that the United States is acting as it should be as a democratic nation um, as being a bully. And so I will resist this by not paying my taxes. And he wrote a whole essay talking about that type of civil disobedience as a means of protesting um, actions that your government might take. Um, Caballero was written by some uh, Mexican-American women from South Texas. Um, Gonzalez was an educator in the uh, Houston area for most of her career. Um, but that one, just to emphasize the kind of long shadow that that war has cast over people in the borderlands um, and in Mexico in terms of thinking about where they came from and um, not just where they came from, but how uh, the war divided their communities and um, threatened to split families and sometimes did, um, especially presently. Um, it has a long legacy in writing and in history. Jose Martí, El Poeta de América, the America's poet, um, he came from a similar tradition as Darío, uh, but he was a Cuban independence leader. Um, so if you know uh, about the Spanish-American War, it actually started as the Cuban War for Independence. 
under Marti and other uh, leaders it has a little bit deeper history than that, um, which is super important, but we can't get into it here. Um, but Marti wrote um, essays, he wrote poems, um, he wrote short, short stories about um, the need of finding a way of looking at the Americas that didn't cast it in this civilization versus uh, barbarism kind of mold uh, that I mentioned before, uh, but instead sees America as um, a place with a unique culture that needs uh, to be preserved. And when he said America, he was talking about the hemisphere. Um, he was not talking about the United States. Um, and he used those arguments to make his case for Cuba's independence from Spain. Uh, another moment that was a kind of uh, 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 turning point for Latin American literature was the Spanish Civil War, 1936-39. This was when Francisco Franco came to power there. Uh, the fascist uh, dictator that ruled in Spain until 1975 uh, or so. Um, and so at this point then, as, as people, including intellectuals, came to fight against Franco, even though it was a losing battle, um, they didn't know that at the time, um, moments like that influenced the poetry um, and the writing of the time in terms of style. And again, I'm not a literature professor, so I'm not getting into all those specific stylistic changes, um, but we are going to read um, a poem from Gabriela Mistral, a Chilean poet um, who was born in a small rural city um, in Chile. Um, she was self-educated and she became a teacher um, and she began to write uh, early in her life. Um, she was influenced by the period of disillusionment following World War I. Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the avant-garde um, way of writing. It was a worldwide movement um, that came uh, after the destruction of the war, thinking about uh, how all the promises of Western society and even capitalism had seemingly failed, or at least they had only amounted to um, this monumental bloodbath um, in Europe, in the trenches. Um, and so people were writing to kind of critique the way that society was, was had been run, to critique um, hyper-nationalism, and so on. But then there were folks like Mistral who um, wrote from her own uh, kind of personal experiences. So she had a boyfriend who uh, killed himself um, when she was younger. Um, let me see where I wrote this. Um, and so her first book of poems was inspired by that and her writing letters to God, trying to defend her boyfriend and uh, uh, beg for forgiveness for him. Um, so she had this sort of modern outlook on the world, but also a very uh, religious one as well. And she was able to balance um, stories about pain and hope in ways that were very much relatable and that um, really uh, touched many, many people who read her work. This guy over here is Jorge Icasa, um, an Ecuadorian author who was a playwright. Um, he wrote plays that were um, kind of politically critical in nature, had a couple of them censored, and so he decided to try something else. And in 1934, he published a book called Wasipungo. Um, Wasipungo is a, an indigenous book or an uh, indigenista book um, in the kind of tradition of, of Ave Sinido that we talked about just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, Wasipungo is an uh, indigenous word that's been corrupted. It's the, the word for the plot of land that the native people were given on the hacienda. And so the story that he tells um, really emphasizes the abuses, um, again, enacted against indigenous people, the harsh labor conditions that they face, um, and the power structures that are in place. So there's also uh, kind of an evil uh, parish priest and a hacienda owner, as well as some overseers um, that are, are uh, making life difficult for the laborers on their hacienda. A man named Andres uh, uh, Chile, I, my handwriting's bad. Uh, Chile Hinga is the main protagonist of the book, and Andres, everything 
that could go wrong for him possibly does go wrong for him and he's mistreated um, endlessly. It's a difficult book to read in that way. I actually read it um, for an undergrad Spanish literature book or Spanish literature class that I took um, quite a few years back now. Um, so it's a difficult read, but it's a it's an important read in terms of of having a prominent writer bring to light these kinds of issues. Um, this was also the time frame in which Diego Rivera, um, Siqueiros, and Orozco were painting murals in Mexico. Much of their work was uh, indi uh, indigenous as well, indigenista as well. Um, and so it was a time where artists, writers were trying to emphasize the indigenous roots of Latin America and try to um, show that those were things to be celebrated, traditions to be celebrated. Um, so something about Huasipungo then is it was not the costumbrista um, sort of uh, pseudo ethnography of indigenous people, but it was a cry to say that there are injustices being committed here that should be corrected. All right, we have a mess of, of guys here. So the major um, kind of historical event of the mid 20th century that influenced uh, Turner in writing was the Cuban Revolution, 1959. And it was at that time that a boom in the Latin American novel took place. And I mean, it's called The Boom um, by uh, scholars of literature. And these are just a few of its major figures. Um, here we have Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentine. Um, we're reading a little bit from his work. And he actually uh, predated the boom. I mean, he had a very lengthy uh, writing career. Um, he crossed genres as well. He wrote many short stories that were philosophical in nature. And the one that we'll read, The Book of Sand, um, is very much uh, philosophical in nature, deals with the idea of infinity. Um, it's, it's a pretty fascinating story. Um, but uh, so he, he looms large over Latin American literature, as does, whoops, I don't know what I did. Oh, I do know what I did. We'll get it back here. Let me just do this so that it gets big again. There we go. Um, so Borges, uh, then we have, uh, uh, here we have uh, Garcia Marquez, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Colombian writer. Um, and I should mention that uh, many of these guys won the Nobel Prize, as did um, uh, Gabriela Mistral. Gabriela Mistral won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1945. Um, Borges never actually won the Nobel Prize for Literature, but Garcia Marquez did in 1982. Um, the guy next to him is Eduardo Galeano, who was an, a Uruguayan um, writer. He wrote in a way that combined kind of fiction and nonfiction and poetry and prose in a super fascinating way. If you get a chance to read The Open Veins of Latin America, it's a very activist book. Um, pointing out the injustices of, of long-term colonialism and imperialism on Latin American nations and its peoples, um, but done in a very great way. And later in his life, he wrote a book called The Book of Embraces, um, uh, which was, uh, uh, was, again, very touching, thinking about human relationships and conditions. Uh, this guy here is Julio Cortázar. Um, he is an Argentine writer. Um, also part of this boom generation. Uh, we're reading one of his short stories uh, this week. And he, he liked to write kind of almost bordering on the science fiction, uh, more getting into how the mind works. Um, so you'll, you'll see that as we go along. Um, this is Mario Vargas Llosa. He won the Nobel Prize in 2010. Um, and one of his works that I really enjoyed is The War of the End of the World. Um, he's written many, many other things, and I don't think that one's even considered one of his best, uh, but it's about the uh, situation in Canudos from the perspective of Antonio Consigliero um, and from the perspective of uh, some young uh, journalists who went along with the army that was going to put down the Canudos colony um, in the 1890s. And so it's, it's very well done. I recommend it if you're interested. Here we have Pablo Neruda. Um, Chilean poet who was exiled for his um, at least perceived communist leanings um, during his lifetime. He spent a lot of time in Europe in exile, but he won the, the Nobel Prize for his poetry in 1971. 
um, other Latin American writers that I didn't picture here who also won the Nobel Prize included Miguel Angel Asturias. He was a Guatemalan uh, who wrote El Señor Presidente um, about uh, Barrios, the president uh, that essentially sold out to uh, United Fruit uh, Company. And so it was a critique of a dictator. Um, he received the award in 1967. Um, and then we also had a uh, Mexican writer, Octavio Paz, who received the Nobel in 1990. All of these people were influenced by this woman here. Um, her name was Carmen Balcells. Um, and if you click on her photo, if you bring up the slideshow, um, there's a New Yorker article that talks about the way that she kind of helped shape this generation of writers, uh, which again, I think is an important story uh, to help us understand um, not just gender relations, but also um, role that other folks played in building this literary boom. Just a couple more slides, but important ones. Um, I wanted to mention the testimonial writing tradition. So testimonials, testimonies, these are works that combine um, real lived experiences. So they're not just autobiographies, but they uh, bring in um, experiences from others that uh, the writers have heard in order to kind of tell the story of an entire people. Um, testimonials have been critiqued because they are not always necessarily true, uh, true to facts, uh, but they're written in ways that help generate memory. Um, and as the, the title of this uh, anthology on uh, feminist testimonials uh, kind of suggests, Telling to Live, it's about telling stories to challenge um, injustices that have been committed to bring the truth out and to gain some sort of, of redress for wrongs that have been done. So Rigoberta Menchu and Alicia Partnoy are two of the um, kind of main or most well-known, I guess, uh, writers of testimonios. Rigoberta Menchu um, had her autobiography uh, she dictated it to a writer in Paris. There's a very fascinating story around um, how the text kind of uh, came out and was published. Um, but it was published as I, Rigoberta Menchu. She won the Nobel Peace Prize. So she didn't win a, a prize in literature, but the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts uh, to bring to light the genocide that had been committed against her people, the Mayan people in Guatemala, in the 1980s. Um, and so that, that book can be a very difficult thing to read, but a very important one that tells not just about the injustices, but also helps to preserve the culture of her people. Alicia Partnoy um, was one of the disappeared in Argentina under the military dictatorship. So The Little School is a memoir that, um, it's not that, that it combines truth and fiction, but it's her experiences of how she got through it of how she was able to survive the torture and the um, horrors that she experienced while a prisoner in a place called La Escuelita, or the little school. Um, and so again, these have very uh, pointed purposes and they tell very important stories. Lastly, um, what I've called this is, is forging a new tradition. These are writers who, um, don't live in the borderlands, but have lived in two nations. Uh, most of them came from Latin American uh, nations and then lived in the United States where they wrote um, and were able to tell stories about immigration, what it is to be a migrant. And uh, those are very important stories to be told at this particular moment in time. Um, so we have Isabel Allende, a Chilean writer, um, who uh, was the niece of Salvador Allende. Um, the president who was overthrown in the 1973 CIA-backed coup. Uh, Julia Alvarez, her family comes from the Dominican Republic, although she grew up mostly in New York and spent her life uh, largely in the United States. And then we have Daniel Alarcón, who we, of course, got to know um, through Radio Ambulante. Um, and he, uh, born in Peru, grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and now lives in New York and produces a really cool podcast about Latin American stories. Um, some of the key works that these uh, folks have written, uh, Isabel Allende is known for many, many short stories. We, of course, read one of hers already. Um, she wrote The House of the Spirits, 
um, Alvarez wrote in the time of the butterflies, among many others. Uh, this one uh, tells the story of the Mirabal sisters uh, who challenged the Trujillo dictatorship um, in the Dominican Republic in the 1950s. And Daniel Alarcón has written several. Um, this is Lost City Radio. It's a, a fictional account that is placed in a, uh, a location much like Lima, uh, where he is uh, from, where his family is from. The only writer that we'll be reading that I haven't said anything about is Carolyn Forche. Um, she's an American. She was a journalist. Uh, my brother-in-law actually went to school with her at Sarah Lawrence uh, for a time. She spent time in many places throughout Central America. And so what we get in her poem that we'll be reading is an American's account of witnessing, or at least um, hobnobbing isn't quite the right word, but having to be in the presence of a violent uh, uh, military leader, excuse me, in 1970s Latin America. And so what her writing kind of helps us understand is the way that poetry and short story writing can be a creative outlet to try to work through difficult uh, human situations. So again, I mean, she met dictators, she met people who tortured others, she um, understood that that was the case. Um, same thing with Partnoy and uh, Rigoberta Menchu. How do you deal with the horrors of the human condition? And how can you turn that into something that could be empowering and something that can promote culture? Um, so again, I just wanted to underscore all of that as I sign off here. Um, thanks for listening to me. Sorry if I rambled a little in the middle, um, but I think that that gives a, a decent overview of Latin American literatures and I hope that this might spark uh, some interest in you to maybe read a little more over the holidays.